Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium, episode 69, Lost to the West. I want you to imagine that you're having a party, and all your friends and family and colleagues and teammates are there, everyone's having a good time, and you decide to make a speech. And you stand up in front of all of them and say, I dare the universe to strike me down. Or do something bad to me. Come on, do your worst. Now, if you ignore the part where everyone you know now thinks you're crazy, does that sound like something you could do? Would you be comfortable doing that? Or... Let me ask you a different question. Do you believe that a certain combination of words said aloud could bring about disaster on an individual? Do you believe that if I made you read some words off a piece of paper, that a tree might fall on your car, or your house might become infested, or that you would be mugged on your way home? I'm assuming that most of you don't believe that. We live in a supposedly rational, secular age. We look for evidence and we know that people say terrible things all the time and nothing bad seems to happen. But would you yourself want to stand up and say, I dare you, I dare you world to make something bad happen to me? Would you want to tempt fate in that way? Or would you agree to be cursed by someone? The rational part of you, I think, doesn't really believe anything bad will happen. But something is holding you back, isn't it? You wouldn't actually be comfortable doing that, particularly in front of other people. It would give you an uneasy feeling. You don't really believe anything bad would happen if someone else did it, but you'd prefer that it was them taking part in this particular experiment, and not you. Now that's a silly example, I know, but I wanted to pull out a feeling that I think many of us still have today that connects us directly to the people of the past. If I asked that same question of an 8th century Roman, I think they would say, of course not, of course I wouldn't do that. Why would I want to mock God in that way? Now, We today might say, well, yeah, he or she doesn't have our level of education or scientific understanding of the world. They believe that God directly interferes in the lives of humans, but we know better than that. Now, thanks to psychology or sociology, we can explain why we might be afraid of tempting fate. Our parenting or our Society might lead us to be susceptible to the idea that some invisible force could harm us if we said or did the wrong thing. My point being that it still makes me uneasy to do that, even if I know better. Whereas for that 8th century Roman, they're feeling uneasy and they know why. For them, God is involved in their lives directly or indirectly all the time. When they're in church on Sunday, they hear about how God rewards and punishes people. When they get paid in cash, they see evidence of God's favor for the emperor and his administration. If they can read, they might open a book and learn about men and women from the past whose success or failure was generally dictated by their moral behavior. Those were the ideas that were reinforced across society. You only had to walk the streets of Constantinople to know that Constantine was a wonderful Christian man. How else could he have built such a city? And Justinian must have been very pious for God to aid him in constructing the Hagia Sophia, a building unlike any other. When I give that example, what I want you to understand is that this was not a foolish or superstitious worldview. I think it's too easy to fall into the trap of dismissing people from the past as idiots. Yeah, they, well, 
They didn't have science. So they saw something unusual and just thought, ooh, miracle. Solar eclipse, miracle. Rainbow, miracle. Pig falls over, miracle. Uh, Or perhaps more charitably, uh, during the history of Rome, we heard about generals delaying battle because the entrails of their sacrificed animals weren't giving them the right signs or the sacred chickens refused to eat. Even the intense discussions about the nature of Jesus' divinity might seem to some listeners to be a waste of time. You know, these people just didn't know any better. They were stupid. Now, I'm sure most of you are more understanding than that. The longer I spend reading history, the more I come to believe that human beings are just human beings. Their fundamental capabilities and inclinations haven't changed that much over the centuries. Or perhaps it's fairer to say, we've been on this planet for a very long time altogether. It's not surprising that in the last 2,000 years, not so much has changed. Just because we know so much more than people of the past doesn't make their logic foolish. Let me give you an example of how a Roman might have thought about the world. And it's not my example, it comes from historian Mark Witto, and rather than tamper with it, I'll give it to you in full. Imagine a situation where a hut collapses and kills a man who was sleeping inside. Once he or she had inspected the scene, a Roman would agree with us that the hut had fallen because termites had eaten through its main supporting beam but they might regard that as only a rather obvious first step. For them, the real question would be why the termites ate through that beam in that particular hut and why it fell with that specific person inside. Our response that this was just a matter of bad luck or coincidence would be seen by them as a bizarre failure to answer the obviously significant questions. Romans throughout the ages, watched helplessly as their best laid plans were destroyed by drought, or flood, or locusts, or disease, or storms, or a civil war. Good administrators might plan brilliant expeditions only to see their fleet smashed against the rocks. Sometimes men just fell over dead with no obvious explanation. To look for divine causation in these events, rather than a display of ignorance, could be viewed as the logical response to making sure things went better next time. It's an extra layer of causality that we in modern times have stripped away. But we are the outlier, we should remember. Throughout history, and amongst many cultures today, some version of that Roman view prevails that things beyond our understanding do affect human events. During the siege of 717, the residents of Constantinople still packed their storehouses with food, they still piled up weapons at the walls, and built new ships as fast as they could. But they believed that these acts alone were not the sole determinant of their fate. And I think this is our responsibility if we really want to understand the past. We have to try and discard our preconceived notions of how the world works. If you get into the Roman mindset, or the mindset of anyone from the 8th century, then a divine explanation for certain events can make a lot of sense. I mean, look at the rise of the Caliphate. It was now the greatest empire the world had ever known. It stretched from the Atlantic to the Indus River or the steppe lands to the north, about five and a half thousand miles from one end to the other. But the Arabs had lived in Arabia since biblical times. How do you explain their unbelievable success? Do you say it's because a -a once-in-a-lifetime demographic collapse happened that allowed the plague and war-ridden armies of Rome and Persia to stand temporarily vulnerable, just as new leaders emerged who could pull the Arabs together to win pitched battles and then sensibly build on that with shrewd occupation and taxation policies that created an effective war machine which could pull in new recruits and direct them outward? (sighs) 
Or do you think that God decided to grant the Arabs this new power? If you think if you think about it like that, then a supernatural explanation can seem far more easy to grasp, far more sensible, far more logical. The Romans had stood tall for a millennia, and now they had been utterly vanquished because of, what, a, a few bad decisions by an emperor or, or Yersinia Pestis? I mean, it, psh, ridiculous. The Arabs had no doubt that God was responsible for their success. And what other evidence did they need than the miraculous nature of their victories to confirm the truth of Islam? As the world turned its gaze then towards Constantinople in 717, these are the questions that men and women asked themselves. Would God allow the Arabs control over New Rome? And what would that mean? What did it mean if he didn't? This was now an existential question. The Arabs would have to march to China to find a state as organized as Byzantium. Only the Romans stood in their way now. Was the caliphate about to put an end to the Christian Empire? Amongst the Muslims of Syria and Palestine, excitement was in the air. Every year they welcomed home the tired but victorious armies who'd raided and sacked Anatolia. Now they sensed the cross-worshipping Romans would finally be broken. In fact, it wasn't just the momentum of victory which was causing a buzz. Amongst the apocalyptic predictions which swirled around the Middle East, one had come to be highly publicized. A prophecy had declared that in year 100 of the Muslim calendar, the world would finally be given over to Islam. Year 1 of that calendar was 622, when Muhammad left Mecca for Medina. So with 722 fast approaching, a siege of new Rome opened up the possibility of all the lands beyond embracing Allah in the near future. Pious men were signing up for the campaign, but joining them were the ambitious and the homeless. The speculation about the riches of Constantinople was running rampant. Even if you could only hope to be someone's servant or someone's cook on this expedition, once the gates were opened, it would be a free-for-all, and the treasures of the ancient Roman Empire would make you rich no matter who you were. Arab financiers were providing horses and equipment for free on the understanding that they would be repaid double from the looted spoils. Inside the empire, everyone knew the attack was coming, as confusion and dislocation reigned. Remember that about three emperors ago, the order went out that if you couldn't store enough to feed your family for three years, then you needed to leave the capital. Leo probably reissued such an instruction when he arrived, so people were on the road, spreading the news of the city's trepidation. Others were fleeing the two massive Arab armies that had snaked their way across the landscape, touching everyone in their path. Farmers and fishermen across Anatolia had been forced to hand over their produce to Maslama, while those living around the capital had been given requisition orders by Leo's men. Even those on remote Aegean islands would soon catch a glimpse of the giant Arab fleet as it passed by, heading north. And beyond Byzantium, the tremors were being felt. The Italians, the Lombards, and the Franks all knew about the rise of the Caliphate. Refugees from Spain and Africa had been arriving for the past two decades with tales of how strong and indefatigable the enemy was. New Rome may not have been what old Rome was, but it was still understood by all to be the capital of the Christian world and the best hope for resistance to this frightening onslaught. Even the Monophysites in the Caliphate were eyeing the horizon for news from the front. They may not have wished to return to the persecution of the Orthodox, but the destruction of the Christian Empire was a thought that sent a shiver down the spine. As we heard in the interview with David Gyllenhaal, 
the specific explanation being peddled by the state and the church was that the Arabs' victories represented punishment for sin. This would have been interpreted a number of different ways, depending on your location or your education. Maybe it was Heraclius's incestuous marriage that had set this all off. Maybe it was the Monophysites. Maybe it was the Orthodox. Maybe it was just the sinning in the minds and actions of the whole population. No one explanation was accepted, but as the Arab armies closed in on the capital, people must have wondered, wait a minute, it couldn't be that this is it. Is God really going to allow the heathens to rule over his chosen people? Were they still the chosen people? This is why, as our story resumes, you need to remember that the intelligent, logical, and rational people on both sides were not just looking for victory. They were looking for a sign from God about his intentions. And God was not about to disappoint them. Leo became emperor at the end of March 717, but Maslama's forces didn't reach the city until July. This was a crucial period of time for the emperor as he familiarized himself with the machinery of government and investigated the capital's preparations for a siege. Don't be fooled into thinking that Leo is a wise old dog who had seen it all in his long career. He was actually 31 years old, or thereabouts. As they always do, civil wars see the most experienced men cut down or exiled, and the chance for the young and ambitious to rise. Leo was working hard to establish himself as a worthy emperor under the most stressful circumstances that the empire had ever faced. Leo understood that the Romans would be vastly outnumbered in the coming struggle, and so his focus was on building more ships and strengthening the defences at the walls. He needed to make the siege last as long as possible if he was going to grind the Arabs down to size. This is the first time in our sources that we hear of a great chain being pulled across the Golden Horn. This wasn't an innovation, we heard of one being used when the Arabs took Carthage, but it would become an important part of the network of defences for Constantinople from now on, and was secured on one side in the suburb of Sikai, and at the other end by a gate in the sea walls. It's not clear if Maslama spent the summer making necessary preparations, or if he was waiting for Leo to surrender the city to him. Certainly the Arab historians think it was the latter, and claim that Leo was sending letters constantly, stalling the general's advance. However, it seems equally possible that the general simply felt he needed more time to occupy Anatolia and collect supplies for his army. Maslama knew that Constantinople would not fall easily. If Leo failed to convince the city to surrender, then it would have to be besieged, and that meant camping outside its walls for the winter. So the general wanted to make sure that his army was fed, and that the Byzantines would be unable to resupply themselves. His army spent some time subduing the areas around Sardis and Pergamum, while his subordinate Suleiman was sent to capture Chalcedon and pillage the surrounding countryside. We don't know a huge amount about Maslama personally. He was one of the many sons of Abd al-Malik, and therefore grew up as an Umayyad prince amongst much luxury. However, his mother was a non-Arab slave girl, and not the wife of the caliph. So while four of his half-brothers would become caliphs themselves, he was never considered for the top job. Whether this factored into his desire to be the man who would capture Constantinople, we don't know. It would be easy to do some armchair psychoanalysis and see that fact as a major inspiration. The Caliph Suleiman was fully supportive of his half-brother and had prepared a giant fleet in the ports of Cilicia, which was being loaded with men, animals and supplies, ready to head west. We have some dubious numbers on those involved in this mission, but let's just say that thousands of workmen and thousands of camels and mules were there, along with huge stocks of weapons and provisions, along with fresh troops, 
and many sailors. In late June, either losing patience with Leo or just finishing his preparations, Maslama marched to the city of Abydus and met Suleiman and his forces there. Abydus overlooks the Dardanelles, or what was then known as the Hellespont. This is the very narrow entrance to the Sea of Marmara, where Constantinople sits. It made for the shortest possible crossing for the Arab armies, and they used boats to get safely across. You can see all this on the maps page at the website. It's in the top right-hand corner. And if you scroll down that page, you can see a wide shot of the empire, a close-up of the environs of Constantinople, and of course a map of the city itself. There was no sign of Byzantine resistance as the Arab army made camp in Europe for the first time. The Roman troops were all amassed in the capital, awaiting them. We don't know anything about troop numbers inside the city. It's something of a trade-off, because if you bring in every soldier you have, then you will go through your supplies that much quicker. And really, because the Theodosian walls are so strong, you only need a certain number of men to man them. Heraclius had sent 12,000 to do that job in 626, and that's probably a fair estimate this time. It seems like a core of theme troops were kept somewhere across the shore in Anatolia, in the cities which the Arabs hadn't taken. The feeling may have been that they could be snuck across the Bosphorus if things became desperate. Despite the concentration of forces inside the city, Maslama's path to the capital was not wide open as he may have thought. A night or two after they'd arrived, the Arab camp was set upon at night, with members of Maslama's personal guard amongst those slaughtered. When daylight arrived, the general realized who it was. The Bulgars were in the vicinity. A few days later, another group of Arab soldiers encountered Turval's men and were so badly routed that they returned to the main army with terrifying tales of the ferocity of the enemy. During the summer, Leo had sent word to Turval that he was more than happy to honour whatever deal Theodosius had worked out with him. But more to the point, there would be even more rewards on offer if the Bulgars would attack the incoming Saracen army. You might think that Turval would welcome an attack on Byzantium, given his people's constant struggles with them. But the Bulgar leadership were wiser than that. Despite their inevitable friction with the Romans, the empire had proved weak enough to let the Bulgars comfortably establish themselves south of the Danube. The Arabs had an empire which stretched beyond the horizon's horizon. Turval understood that if the caliphate extended its rule to Constantinople, then he'd be faced with a far greater threat. The Bulgars had no interest in meeting the Arabs in open battle, but descending out of the Thracian plain to hit and run, that they were very happy to do. The Arabs were put on notice that if they attempted to go too far north in search of supplies, they would be given a very hostile reception. And for accuracy's sake, I should point out that we aren't sure if Turval was still Khan at this point, but Nicephorus and Theophanes just assume he was, and without anything concrete to contradict them, I will stick to that line. Despite this setback, Maslama pressed on with confidence. He had prepared well for the siege, and hoped he wouldn't need to forage in Thrace for much more food. As he marched north, his army captured key Thracian towns on the south coast, and gathered up any supplies they could find. This included harvesting any crops that Leo hadn't already hidden behind the Theodosian walls. Maslama appeared before the city in mid-July. We don't know how large his army was, but once the fleet arrived, it was said to number 80,000. That's roughly the same number the Avars were said to have had in 626. Between the engineers, sailors and camp followers who would swell Maslama's ranks, it's not an implausible number, but probably on the high end of any guesswork. It was certainly large enough to make Byzantine sorties unlikely, and made a big impression on those guarding the walls, as you can imagine. No one inside the city had been alive the last time the city was besieged. 
Nothing could prepare them for the shock of seeing thousands of men stretched out in front of them. Weapons glinting in the sun, siege works being prepared, abusive taunts yelled up at you. The terrifying prospect of a weakness in your defences that you didn't know about, the paranoia of every shadow at night that could represent a sneak attack that would cost you more than your life. Maslama ordered his men to make camp across the three-mile stretch of the walls. They had to build their own walls, facing both the city and the Bulgars to the west. On each side, the Arabs dug a ditch and then dragged large stones to form an uncemented wall of protection at chest height. Maslama had also brought seeds with him and planted crops on land within the camp. He knew that he could be here for a long time and was taking nothing for granted. Our sources are sparse on any actual fighting at the land walls. Perhaps tellingly, one chronicler says that Maslama initially thought the defences might be breachable using conventional siege weapons, but quickly learned his mistake. Perhaps this was the first moment when a Byzantine soldier or official might have begun to see the hand of God at work. Once the Arabs made an attack on the walls, the imposing nature of their construction would have become totally clear. No other city had walls like these, so high, so solid, so deadly. As intimidating as the giant Arab army was, it would fill you with confidence to stand high, high above them, out of arrow range, able to pick your enemies off at will as they made their desperate attempt to scale the giant structures. Historian Mark Witto makes another excellent point, this time about the Roman inheritance of Constantinople. He points out that if the land walls hadn't been built in the early 400s, then the 7th and 8th century Byzantines would never have been able to construct them. By the time they really needed them, in 626 or now in 717, the resources of the eastern provinces were gone and the relevant manpower and technology didn't exist to construct something on this scale. We can be pretty confident of that because archaeologists have examined the sea walls and the extension to the land walls built around the suburb of La Chierne, and have found that the work done there is of far inferior quality. Standing atop those walls in 717 was like standing on the shoulders of giants. It was a reminder of God's favour to the Roman people, and perhaps a sign that he had not abandoned them yet. From the Arab sources, we can also confirm that by this time the walls were fitted with a moat. A small retaining wall held the water in place against the first of the three defensive lines. If any Arab troops now lay dead in those fetid waters, Maslama was not overly concerned. He returned to fortifying his camp, building wooden huts and storehouses while he waited for the fleet to arrive. His men also prepared more siege engines, mangonels, movable towers and catapults. Maslama made his own camp down at the Hebdomon, just opposite the city's golden gate. This meant he had access to the port there, and he now awaited for the arrival of his ships and the overwhelming superiority of numbers and supplies that they would bring. By early September, the Arab navy appeared in the Sea of Marmara. Again, there would have been shock on the walls of the city as the tiny black dots appeared in a seemingly never-ending mass in the distance. As they came closer, they became recognisable as a giant fleet of warships, troop transports and vessels of all shapes and sizes. The histories record that 1,800 ships were in the Armada. Now, 1,800 is a huge number, but then again, 600 boats were used to ferry Belisarius and his 16,000 troops to Africa. So even if 1,800 is too many, I can imagine it was more than 600. This was a very serious attempt to knock the Roman Empire out for good. 
The supply ships began to pile up on the shore by the Hebdomen and spent several days unloading supplies. Now it was time for the siege to actually begin. To starve out the citizens of Constantinople would take a supreme effort. As you know, the city was incredibly well situated to withstand a siege. Inside the walls were giant cisterns to catch rainwater. Between those walls and the suburbs, there was farmland, fields and orchards and gardens to grow fresh supplies. The Golden Horn allowed fishing to go on as well. So you really had to cut off every other avenue of supply just to get the citizens inside to use up their resources. And the city had many avenues of supply. It had access to both the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, as well as an incredibly short crossing at the Bosphorus, the narrow sea lane which flows between Europe and Asia. In order to successfully prosecute the siege, the Arab fleet would need to blockade the Bosphorus, not only cut off each entrance to it, but ideally to get into the centre and take control of the Golden Horn, that inlet of sea that allows the city to be surrounded on three sides by water. The Golden Horn was a key target. If the Arabs could even get access to part of it, it would leave the city's sea walls open to attack. The sea walls had been built far later than the land walls, and had needed major repairs within the last few years. They were not as high as the land walls, nor were they the feared triple circuit. Scaling them wouldn't be easy, but it was a far better option than the virtually impregnable land walls. Of course, the Roman navy was ready for action, so taking the Golden Horn would be no easy matter, but both sides knew an attempt would be made at some point. Sealing off the southern entrance to the Bosphorus was the easy part, the fleet at the Hebdomen could cut off one side, and now a squadron attacked the harbour at Chalcedon to seal off the other. The real test was about to arrive, though. The Arab fleet now had to run the gauntlet and sail up the Bosphorus. Their plan was to sail past the Golden Horn, scout the Roman fleet as they did, and set up a base in one of the ports just to the north of Sikai. When a favourable wind blew, the squadron set sail. The narrow sea lane forced the fleet to travel in a slim line. Warships took the lead, of course, but following them came supply ships, and at the rear, troop transports to guard against Byzantine ships that might try to chase after them. The Roman fleet waited patiently at the edge of the Golden Horn, the Arab warships stared them down as they passed quietly by. Ideally placed to watch the action was the Emperor Leo. The great palace had many terraces facing outward to sea, overlooking the movements of the Armada, and he was watching closely. Way back in episode 10, I explained how difficult the waters of the Bosphorus are to navigate if you're unfamiliar with them. The Black Sea waters run quickly down, creating a fast surface current, but the heavier Mediterranean waters push back under the surface. As the Arab ships entered the Bosphorus, they found the helpful wind was no longer pushing them along at quite the same tick. As the line of ships stretched out, those at the back began to slow down even more. These were the heaviest vessels, filled with armed men. It was these ships which slowed down so much that a gap began to open in the fleet, growing wider the further the lead ships pulled away. Seeing the opportunity, Leo gave the order for the Roman navy to attack, immediately. Bursting out of the Neorian harbour, the Byzantine fleet was ready, with fire. Some dummy vessels filled with incendiaries were set alight and shoved toward the slow-moving Arab ships. The Bosphorus was so narrow that it was hard to turn and manoeuvre. Great explosions happened on contact and ships went up in balls of flames. The Arabs had to turn and run. Trying to get past the Romans was suicide. But turning, especially heavy vessels, was going to make them sitting ducks. As the transport ships tried to retreat, Byzantine warships 
The Tromons bore down on them. The Arab marines began firing arrows and preparing their swords, but all they could see now was black smoke emerging from the Roman ships and a loud hissing noise, and then suddenly more fire, burning bright and so hot. Out of nowhere their ships were on fire. They were on fire. Men leapt into the sea to escape, but then, the worst horror of all, the flames wouldn't go out. They were impervious to the water. What kind of fire was this? Some ships made it back to the Sea of Marmara, but most didn't. Twenty ships were destroyed. Some burnt up and sank with their crew's screams ringing up to the defenders on the walls. Other boats were disabled and abandoned by their crews. Twenty ships, even those filled with men and supplies, was not a fatal blow to Muslama, but psychologically and strategically it had done real damage. The blockade would go ahead as planned. Most of the column had made it to the port of Sosthenion, about halfway up the Bosphorus. They could cut off any communications with the Black Sea, but any hope of reaching the sea walls was effectively gone. No sailors would volunteer to go near the Golden Horn now, which meant that it would be a long, hard slog in front of the land walls for the Arab army. Back in Constantinople, eyewitnesses quickly passed on the news of the fleet's success. Tales of how the Roman fireships had performed became evidence that the Lord was still with them. How could he not be when water refused to put out his flames? There was not much exaggeration needed to support those who began to claim that the enemy had reached for the walls of the Christian capital, but only a foretaste of hell had greeted them. The miracle bubbling up in the Bosphorus was, of course, what later came to be called Greek fire. As I mentioned back in episode 52, Theophanes records in his history that this liquid fire, as the Romans called it, was used in the, quote, siege of the 670s and caused great havoc and fear amongst the Muslim sailors who experienced it. Now that there's serious doubt about that siege ever happening, it's difficult to know when the fire was first used. Theophanes claims that the substance was created by a certain Callinicus, a Christian architect from Heliopolis in Lebanon. Callinicus had defected or moved to Byzantium and offered his new invention to the Imperial Navy. We have no idea if this story is true, but we can't disprove it. What we do know is that fire had been used as part of warfare going back thousands of years. Tubed flamethrowers are mentioned by Thucydides during the Peloponnesian Wars in the 4th century BC. And even on this podcast I made reference to fire weapons being deployed as part of the Imperial Navy when Anastasius was fending off Vitalian's rebellion. Whether or not the formula for liquid fire was something which the Imperial Navy had been working on for centuries, or if it was one man's invention, we don't know. But clearly by 717, two innovations had been introduced into the equation, which would add up to the Greek fire of the popular imagination. One was that this fire would keep burning even when it landed on water. And second was that it could now be directed from a ship using a siphon. This created a ship-mounted flamethrower which was devastating to men and ships alike. We still don't know today exactly what formula was used to create this substance or exactly how Roman ships were outfitted to use it. However, historians have done their best to discover what might have been. Eyewitness descriptions over the centuries tell us four useful things. One, it was projected from boats using some kind of siphon attached to tubes. Two, it kept burning on top of the sea. Three, it had a very short range, no more than 20 yards. And four, as it was fired, there would be a huge roaring sound and lots of black smoke. Most scholars have pointed to crude oil as the primary source of the fire. We know that crude oil will burn in water, and because of its density, it will float on top of seawater and stay alight for some time. 
The Byzantines definitely had access to crude oil from places like the Crimea or the Caspian shore. The oil could be dug up from shallow wells and transported in large amphorae to Constantinople. But how was the oil stored on ships and set alight? Theophanes describes the imperial warships as cauldron fire bearing thromons equipped with siphons. Based on descriptions of bronze tubes running toward the siphon, we assume that the oil was heated in these cauldrons, then pumped along the tubes and shot out. Why was it heated? Because crude oil is too viscous, too sticky, to flow efficiently down a tube unless it is heated first. In modern pipelines, for example, oil is sometimes heated to gain a better flow. From descriptions of thromons from later Byzantine literature, it seems like ships were equipped with siphons at the bow and the stern, and some even had ones on the sides as well. These siphons had some kind of swivel function to help aim their fiery discharge. We also read about fortified foredecks being built to house the siphons so as to protect the men and the ship below from being burnt. And how would this work in practice? Historian John Halden attempted to recreate Greek fire as part of a documentary filmed in the early 2000s, and this gives us our best guess. Halden and his team used only devices and substances which the Byzantines would have had access to. For a start, the oil had to be heated on a brazier, a metal bowl or box which could house an intense fire safely on a wooden ship. They used flax in the fire as it burns slowly, which again is safer. A bellows could then be used to make the fire burn hotter when it was needed. A bellows is a wooden device that pumps air. Halden found that using the bellows began to create a roaring sound and that the flax creates a lot of smoke when it burns hot, both matching descriptions of liquid fire in action. This brazier needed to be housed somewhere, uh, some kind of cauldron, as Theophanes' description implies. So the team built a little cauldron with a pumping system based on a design by Hero of Alexandria, a contemporary of Augustus. This included swivel joints, pistons, valves, and everything you might expect, all made out of simple bronze. More smoke and roaring followed as the siphon was opened, and a jet of liquid was pumped down it and shot out about 15 metres beyond the boat. Our Byzantine sources imply that the liquid fire ignited of its own accord once it was released, but this doesn't seem possible. Halden's solution was to add a small container welded to the lower lip of the siphon's nozzle. This was filled with rope made from tow and hemp and soaked in oil. Again, this burnt slowly and solidly for 20 minutes straight. And when the oil was fired out of the nozzle, it would pass through this flame and hey presto, liquid fire. In the documentary, only a few seconds of release was needed to set fire to a sailboat 10 metres away, and the heat generated would have been enough to kill the crew or force them to abandon ship. The construction of those fire-bearing ships is a testament to the skills and intelligence of the Roman navy. They knew that it was their technical knowledge that had made liquid fire possible. But for the technology to have been perfected at this moment, for the Arab ships to present themselves just when they did, for everything to have worked out so ideally to deal the enemy a nasty blow, well, the Romans knew who to thank for all of that. In the Hagia Sophia, thanks rang out to God, and also to the Virgin Mary, whose icon, the Othihitria, was once again being paraded around the walls. The more sober-minded of the Romans knew that a few burning ships did not change the situation much. It was not as complete a blockade as Maslama would have liked, but the capital was still cut off from resupply. 
Byzantine warships were clearly able to maneuver somewhat around the Bosphorus and could make contact with the Asian shore, but any attempt to move supplies from one side to the other would have been too dangerous. Soon afterwards, though, word came of another apparent sign of God's intentions. During September, back in Palestine, the Caliph Suleiman fell dead at the age of 43. Too much good living had caught up with him. The Caliph had planned to break with his father's instructions and begin a dynasty of his own. However, his eldest son had predeceased him, and his second was now camped outside the walls of Constantinople. His other sons were infants, and so as he began to slip from this world, his advisers pressured him to appoint someone else, someone who was on hand, and someone who would keep these men in their jobs. Suleiman succumbed to their urgings, and ignoring his own brothers, appointed his cousin Umar to succeed him. Umar was known for his piety and would prove to be far more concerned with the growing tensions inside the caliphate than with attacking Byzantium. It's not clear how much of this would be known inside the Roman capital. But as the news trickled across the empire, those searching for God's plan in these events wouldn't have failed to notice that the man who had dispatched the fleet against the Christian people now lay dead. Could a crisis develop inside the caliphate as a result? It didn't, but the thought that it might stoked the fires of hope. Muslama would not be distracted by this. He had his eyes on the prize as he tightened his grip on the city. Negotiations continued with Leo as autumn set in. You might ask why the Romans would even consider giving up, but we have to ignore hindsight. The Arabs had battered down every important fortress between here and the Taurus Mountains. If they managed to get inside the city, it meant rape, slavery, the despoiling of churches, the loss of everything that the people held dear. Constantinople was ideally situated for a siege, but that doesn't stop people from feeling trapped or desperate. Who knew what might go wrong? Grain can spoil. Water can be poisoned. Rain can stop falling. Paranoia and despair would have gripped everyone inside the city at some point, no matter how inspiring the patriarch's sermons were, or how reassuring the sight of the Virgin's icon was. What Maslama didn't know, though, was whether Leo was seriously considering surrender, or if it was all more delay tactics. This is where our sources differ considerably. The Arab histories are certain that Leo was still leading Maslama to believe that he would surrender the city to him. The emperor had given his word, and surrender was the humane option which would save the people from further suffering. So Maslama had good reason to believe him. He also understood that the emperor couldn't just wait till everyone went to sleep and then unlock the gates. He would have to persuade the people that surrender was their best option. So far, so good. But what happens next just sounds too good to be true. Maslama had taken great care to ensure that his men were going to be fed during the long siege. So he had had wheat collected in Asia, he had it harvested in Thrace, he had it brought from Syria and Egypt and loaded onto the fleet. Once he'd established storehouses inside his camp, he had the wheat piled high and placed under guard. The defenders up on the Theodosian walls could see these great mountains of wheat staring up at them, and news had spread throughout the city. So Leo let Maslama know that one of the problems he had in convincing people to surrender was that they knew the Arabs were settling in for a long siege. The people were willing to take their chances in a battle of who will run out of food first. They were far more scared of waking up in the night to find the Arabs were already in the city. Leo explained that if the people thought that Maslama was about to assault the walls then they would fear for their lives and agree to surrender. But the news coming back from the front line was that no attacks were being made. Men were just sitting around, well prepared to sit around some more. But, 
Leo said. If you were to burn all your wheat, then they would be afraid. Then they would know that you must be about to attack. Because, well, why else would you burn your own food unless you were sure that you were about to start eating off the emperor's table? In fact, don't just burn your wheat. Burn it, but set some aside and put it on a boat and let me take it into the city. That way I can show the people how generous you are. The boat full of wheat is a promise that you will take care of them once you are master of the city. Maslama complied. He handed over some of his supplies and burnt the rest in giant bonfires. Suddenly, Leo changed his tune. Maslama's envoy came to see the emperor and was told, Why would I open the gates? Why would I betray my religion or give up my kingdom? Whoops. Now, obviously, there is some logic to Leo's plan, but Maslama seems like the biggest fool imaginable in agreeing to it. Nicephorus and Theophanes don't mention this incident at all, but as we discussed last episode, it's possible they downplayed Leo's role in the siege. The story comes from the Arab historians who don't otherwise criticize Maslama, And I don't think they're trying to portray him as being dumb as a doornail. I think they want us to see that he was taken in by Leo's personal oath of loyalty. The men writing these histories were long removed from Umayyad times and were working at the court of the Abbasids, the regime which will take over the caliphate in 750. Again, though, I don't think this is simple character assassination. I think it's a story that explains how Maslama was defeated by treachery that has morphed in the telling. These historians were writing in the eight or nine hundreds, and they had to go on the accounts that were handed down to them, and we don't know what these would have recorded precisely or what motives lay behind them. The story goes on to recount two other negotiating points, which sound more plausible. One was Leo offering Maslama money to pack up and leave, essentially giving him some of the spoils of a sacking, uh, but avoiding actual battle. And then later on, as negotiations break down, the emperor offers him safe passage back to Syria, as in the Byzantines would not harass his retreat if he chose to go. Of course, both these offers were ignored, with Maslama refusing to believe anything further that Leo had to say. He may have made another attempt on the land walls in retribution, but if he did, the results were predictable. It's really difficult to know what kind of negotiating took place. I'm sure embassies did go back and forth, as was the case with the Avars, but Whether Leo is an evil genius who laughed at Maslama's foolishness, we don't know. I certainly don't think the Arabs needed to have burnt all their supplies for what happened next to happen. As autumn turned to winter, Maslama prepared his army to maintain the siege. Winters in Constantinople could be cold. It's on about the same line of latitude as New York, but it's usually not quite as cold as that. In 717, though, as December arrived, it turned very cold. Some say freakishly cold. Men inside the city couldn't remember the last winter as harsh as this one. Snow began to fall, and fall, and fall. This was far worse than anything that men from Arabia had ever dealt with. Huddled inside tents and wooden huts, desperately trying to find fuel to keep their fires burning, the besiegers began to suffer. The snow covered the ground and stayed throughout January and February. For 100 days, the grass wasn't visible. The poor horses, camels and mules suffered most from this and began to die. Then the supplies began to run low. Men began to starve. Foraging was already a dangerous activity because of the threat of the Bulgars, but now the ground was barren and the trees 
covered in snow. Starving men become desperate. A measure of wheat had reached the price of ten gold coins. Hungry sailors would tear pitch off their ships and chew it. Others turned to the tree trunks, roots, and leaves. The draft animals were eaten once they died, but the situation became so bad that cannibalism was reported. By now, the unsanitary conditions of the camp were leading to outbreaks of disease. The dead began to pile up. The ground was too hard to bury them in. Men began to fall in their hundreds, possibly thousands. You sense delight in Theophanes' account as he claims that the soldiers were forced to add human excrement to their diets just to stay alive, but this may be no more than a literary flourish. Constrained thus on every side, with the spectre of death before their eyes, they abandoned all hope. So says the chronicler. Maslama tried to keep up morale by reassuring his men that reinforcements and supplies would come in the spring, and that the Byzantines would soon surrender. But he must have had his doubts. His fellow commander Suleiman was amongst the fallen, and news eventually reached him that just before Christmas, a massive earthquake had rocked Syria from Antioch to Edessa. Houses, churches, and other large buildings had collapsed. The area was known for its seismic activity, and an equally violent shudder had hit four years earlier. But if you were searching the heavens for meaning, it was hardly a good sign. Inside Constantinople, of course, there seemed little doubt about God's intentions now. The citizens of the capital were faring far better than those outside. With stone walls and carefully rationed supplies, they kept up their spirits around well-tended fires. Gossip about the Arab army was highly prized, and news of their suffering brought real hope to their hearts. The coldest winter they could remember surely indicated divine defence for the Christian capital. So far, the song of ice and fire which the Lord was singing sounded pretty sweet. By March, the snows had stopped and the ground was thawing. Maslama ordered his men to make a spring harvest from what they had sowed the previous year, and he sent word to Umar, asking for the promised reinforcements and fresh supplies. Umar was already at work, and two new fleets were outfitted, one in Egypt and the other in Africa. We are told that one fleet had 400 ships and the other 360, but again we can just assume that this means a lot of ships. They were carrying more men, but mostly animals, weapons and food. There's a certain irony in this being the very last time that the grain fleets of Alexandria and Carthage would head for the capital of the Roman Empire. Meanwhile, another Syrian army, commanded by the general Mardasan, was ordered to cross the Taurus Mountains and make for Chalcedon. The Caliphate may have been a giant empire, but it could only produce so much surplus for one front. This was the maximum amount that could be spared. A month or two later, and the fleets arrived in the Sea of Marmara. The admirals had been warned about the Byzantine fireships, and so made their way very carefully, hugging the coast they eventually put in somewhere along the Gulf of Nicomedia, east of Chalcedon. Presumably they were planning on waiting there until they could coordinate a crossing with Maslama's navy and get the supplies to the European shore. Part of the need for extreme caution is that Maslama couldn't risk his Hebdoman fleet in direct battle with the Byzantines. If he lost too many ships, he might not be able to carry his men home if the siege failed, and realistically, if his fleet was destroyed, then the siege would be good as dead. He would be trapped in Thrace with nowhere to go. Whether the Byzantine navy would have come out to attack them if they'd made for the Hebdoman, we don't know. But this decision, this delay in the Gulf of Nicomedia, would prove fatal. As you know, the Arab Empire was built on the conquest of non-Muslim people. 
I'm sure there were many Christian sailors and soldiers amongst Maslama's initial force. But a considerable number were men who identified themselves as Muslims, or something close to it by this point. But having outfitted a giant fleet, there were few Muslim sailors to call upon for these second and third efforts. These ships were packed with almost exclusively Christian seafarers. Some had come from Carthage, which had only been conquered two decades before. Christians who had been pressed into service. If the number of ships in action is anything close to accurate, then it's probable that all active sailors were on campaign, and the men called up for these expeditions were those who just worked in the shipyards or were used to short-distance trading trips, not men who would have expected to see combat on this scale. Once they landed on the Anatolian shore, large groups of them began to defect to the empire. Jumping into skiffs and rowing boats, groups headed out into the Bosphorus, yelling up to the walls, Long live the emperor! Theophanes says that so many boats were in the water that it seemed to be entirely covered in wood. This was a gift for Leo. He welcomed these new arrivals warmly, and naturally was very interested to learn the location and the contents of their ships. The Byzantine fleet set off immediately. Blasting their way out of the Bosphorus, they shot across the Marmara, making for the Gulf. Ships filled with kindling would only have slowed them down on this mission. The fleet heading out of the harbour were those armed with liquid fire. Many of the crews of the relief fleets were already on the shore when the Roman navy appeared in the distance. Some just fled into the countryside. Those still in their boats gave up and sailed away. Those that remained were faced with fire. Bursting forth as if from a dragon's mouth, it ignited the ships which moored side by side quickly spread the flames. The fleets were crippled within a couple of hours. The Byzantine victory was so complete that they were able to hop ashore and snatch crates of supplies that had already been unloaded. Returning to the capital like conquering heroes, the sailors showed off their loot to the populace, who cheered at every morsel being taken from the besiegers and brought to the besieged. This was a crippling blow to Maslama. Those supplies would have kept his men fed throughout the summer and allowed him to re-establish their morale. The fresh recruits were now stranded in Anatolia, where they would either be captured or have to live as brigands until they found a way home. But worst of all, those ships were practically irreplaceable. Building a navy is incredibly expensive, and the caliphate wasn't going to be able to create a whole new one out of thin air. More grain might be available in Egypt or Africa, but now it had no way to reach his men. Even worse was to come. The only hope Maslama really had now lay with Mardasan, the general leading another army across Anatolia. If Mardasan's men could occupy Chalcedon and Chrysopolis and essentially cut off the whole of the Asian shore, then it would more completely encircle Constantinople. With those troops in place, there would be no way for Leo to communicate with the remaining theme armies in Anatolia. The citizens of the capital, learning that no reinforcements could reach them, would be far more likely to panic. However, Leo was ahead of Maslama, either shrewdly anticipating the arrival of reinforcements or tipped off by one of the deserters. Leo ordered the theme regiment stationed just across the Bosphorus to go out and lay a trap for the incoming army. They began tracking Mardasan's forces as they advanced unopposed across the countryside. They then concealed themselves in the forested hills somewhere between Nicaea and Nicomedia. When the unaware Arabs had passed by, they fell on them, cutting to pieces the shocked troops. The Syrian army panicked and routed. This was utter disaster. Maslama was now totally isolated outside the walls, and not only was his own army greatly diminished and poorly supplied, but the Byzantines had now restocked their capital. After the destruction of the relief fleets, Roman ships had taken the opportunity to cross to Asia and ferry supplies back to the city. 
Meanwhile, the capital's fishermen were so emboldened that they headed out into the Bosphorus to bring in greater catches. When news of these calamities reached Umar, he wrote to Maslama calling off the siege. What more could be done? The caliphate's best efforts had all come to naught, and the caliph wanted what remained of his forces to return home safely. The son of Abd al-Malik did not want to go, and tried to hide the news from his men, but word got out, and most were more than ready to abandon their miserable surroundings. In August 718, after 13 months before the walls of New Rome, the general reluctantly conceded defeat and ordered his men to pack up. Rubbing salt into the wounds, as Maslama's men disengaged from the siege and began to march south, a large contingent were surprised by a sudden Bulgar attack and suffered a nasty casualty list. The remainder of the fleet were only able to ferry the army back to Anatolia and left them to march hundreds of miles home, living off the land. Umar, with great compassion, sent out a call across his domains, asking that the families of these men come and help them get home. Mules and horses were sent to Cilicia to meet them and ease their return journey. Once back in the caliphate, though, Yersinia Pestis returned to Syria, greeting the poor troops with its usual warm welcome. It would rage throughout Mesopotamia and Iran for the next two years. God seemed to be kicking the Arabs while they were down. And yet still, their suffering was not over. After dropping the men off at Abydus, the fleet left the Sea of Marmara and was caught in a bad storm which sunk many ships. And if the Byzantines needed more confirmation of God's favour, another contingent of the fleet were hit by burning hail. Those who survived watched in horror as their comrades' keels dissolved in the boiling sea. These ships had passed by the volcanic island of Thera, which would, seven years later, erupt. Dogged by the Roman fleet as well, the Arabs suffered yet more losses as they limped home. The residents of Constantinople were no longer in any doubt about whether they were under God's protection. Theophanes comments on the Arabs that many other calamities befell them at that time and made them learn by experience that God and the All-Holy Virgin protect this city and the Christian Empire, and that those who call upon God in truth are not entirely forsaken, even if we are chastised for a short time on account of our sins. The date would be commemorated annually in the church liturgy. One year later, for example, the patriarch Germanus delivered a homily on the deliverance of the city by God. Such dangers our city had never before experienced, and not only our city, but the whole world that is inhabited by Christians. Without doubt, Christ's entire flock would have been in the same peril as ourselves had the godless Saracens attained the goal of their expedition. While the Byzantines had every reason to trumpet that claim as part of their propaganda, the Western world did respond to their victory. Over the next few months, embassies arrived with gifts for Leo seeking his friendship. From the Franks, the Lombards, several Slavic tribes, and even the Kargan of the Avars, a people who knew intimately what Maslama had been through. For the Romans, though, the siege would prove to be only a temporary respite. The Arabs returned within a few years to resume hammering the towns of Anatolia. Civil war would return, and the debate over iconoclasm would seek to answer the question of why the last hundred years had seen the Byzantines so disastrously lose God's favour. No one was sure that the Arabs wouldn't come back, but at least now they knew that they had what it took to stand against them. Constantinople remained an asset like no other. The navy had performed beyond expectations, the army had followed orders, and Leo had proven he was a worthy emperor. The belief in God's protection for his favoured city would only grow once stories of the siege spread around the Mediterranean. <laughs> 
Hopefully you can see now how understandable a belief that was, given all that the defenders had witnessed. The longer the city went unsacked, the more ancient, amazing and mysterious it would appear to its inhabitants. The siege of 717 would prove to be one of its finest hours. In the Muslim world, the failure of the siege was a blow. It was a financial disaster and would encourage disquiet amongst the enemies of the Umayyads, while offering hope to the other enemies on the border. No one doubted Islam's preeminence based on one setback, but the capture of Constantinople began to recede into the distance of apocalyptic predictions. Instead of heralding the dawn of Islam's world triumph, the capture of New Rome now often featured as one of the events that would signal the coming of the end times. In a way, it mirrored Christian predictions about the capture of Jerusalem. Even the mystics on both sides were slowly acknowledging the status quo. As the centuries wore on, accounts of the siege in some Arab histories became unrecognisable from what actually took place. In one of the more famous stories, the Byzantines were said to have actually made formal submission to the Arabs, but been allowed to keep the city. In this telling, Leo opens the gates and allows Maslama a sort of triumph through the streets. The emperor then greets the general like his master at the Hagia Sophia and escorts him around. Grudging acknowledgement of fortress Constantinople comes from a 9th century Arab geographer who describes it as the greatest city of the Romans and their refuge. The perspective of those back in the Levant is perhaps summed up by a Syriac chronicler who said of the Muslims that over Constantinople, God has not yet given them any power. The siege of 717 has often been hailed as one of the key battles in history. The Russian historian Alexander Vasiliev said, It is justly claimed that by his successful resistance, Leo saved not only the Byzantine Empire and the Eastern Christian world, but all of Western European civilization. Many others echo these sentiments. It certainly was a momentous event, and definitely one that has been largely lost in the Western popular imagination. History would definitely have been different if Maslama had succeeded. But I think a little perspective is needed. Modern historians point out that the siege itself was not the moment that changed the dynamics between the empire and the caliphate. The Umayyads went back to raiding Anatolia, and given the right circumstances, might have tried again one day. But the Umayyads fell, and the Abbasids rose in their place. The Abbasids were to build Baghdad to be their new capital. As we will discuss at the end of the century, that move east made New Rome more distant both geographically and spiritually from the concerns of the Caliphs. Together with that, the Caliphate was reaching the limits of its expansion, in the 730s, a series of confrontations with the Franks would shutter the ambitions of the armies in Spain. In the 740s, a massive Berber rebellion would disrupt the caliphate's rule across North Africa. In modern Kazakhstan, the Western Turk tribes united to resist Muslim advance, eventually drawing the Chinese into the conflict. And the Khazars, encouraged by the failure of the siege, would soon attack the Arabs in the Caucasus, beginning two decades of bloody but indecisive fighting in the mountains. The resistance of Constantinople was vital for the survival of the Romans, no doubt. It also maintained the plausibility of claims that God really did favour the Christians. But it was part of wider events which would contain the advance of the Arabs, even a Muslim victory in 717 would not necessarily have led to the conquest of Europe. Any number of things could have happened, and I suspect that the dynamics of the internal politics of the caliphate 
would have been deeply affected by the capture of the city. After all, if someone wanted to resist central authority, what better headquarters could you ask for than the impregnable fortress on the Bosphorus? Certainly the West and Christian civilization would have been shocked by defeat, but there are no guarantees about whether the Arabs had the men or the means to successfully absorb the Roman Empire and head out to conquer the Balkans, Italy, Germany, and so on. I don't want to devalue the siege. It was an important victory, and certainly defeat would have changed the world one way or another. But one battle does not determine the outcome of a clash of civilizations like this, and it's important not to overemphasize consequences that we can't be sure of. As the centuries passed, it's easy to see why the siege grew in importance. The caliphate had their chance to conquer the world, and they didn't take it. Constantinople would not be bothered by a serious attempt to take it for another 500 years. It's understandable that the Byzantines would want to take credit for the survival of the West. And now that they're gone, it's our job to remember what they did. While we're pouring cold water on this victory parade, let me just mention something briefly about Greek fire. Obviously, this was seemingly a very high-tech weapon for the times and caused genuine terror in enemy fleets. However, liquid fire was not a war-changing invention. With a range of only 20 feet, the Romans put themselves in serious danger of being boarded or shot to pieces every time they used it. Also, the fact that the flames stayed alight once they hit the sea meant that your own ship was in serious danger of catching fire. Using this liquid in choppy or windy conditions was out of the question. The only safe time to use it was in very calm waters, and ideally in a defensive capacity. As in, ideally when your fleet don't have to travel far with burning hot oil on board, because out in the Mediterranean there was a very good chance you would just set your own ship on fire. Liquid fire was an ideal weapon for use in the defence of Constantinople especially with the very calm waters of the Golden Horn and often calm waters of the Sea of Marmara. But in most other situations, it was of very limited value. We don't hear of its use often, and despite Roman propaganda, we know that the Caliphate soon worked out how to make it for themselves, but didn't find it that useful. Humans always adapt, and heavy timbered warships were less susceptible to the flames than lightly constructed vessels and sand could be used to smother the flames if you got there quickly enough. The Byzantine historians describe their fire as if it was another divine source of protection for the city, the technological equivalent of the Virgin Mary, if you will. And in many ways it did function like that. It was devastating in this particular location. But if you're wondering why the Romans didn't set sail immediately to burn their enemies alive, then you now know why. Finally, of course, the term Greek fire comes from the Crusaders, who referred to the Romans as Greeks. The Byzantines themselves always called it liquid fire. A couple more things before we go. The first is that I thought you might want to know the fate of Maslama, as he won't appear in our story again in a major way. He was not disgraced by defeat, even though I'm sure it was a disheartening failure. Umar dispatched him to become governor of Iraq and quell a number of rebellions there. And after Umar's death, the title of caliph passed back to his brothers, first Yazid and then Hisham. Under the latter, Maslama would return to action in Armenia before taking charge of the war effort against the Khazars. As you know, he was a highly capable military leader and was said to have twice bested the Khagan himself in battle. However, he fell foul of court politics and headed into retirement on his estates in northern Syria before dying in late 738. He was clearly one of the finest generals of his time, but will largely be remembered for the one battle he didn't win. As for me, it's been 22 months since the initial fundraising episode went on sale, and I've been able to keep going since then, thanks to all of those who contributed then and since. 
and those who've bought the Origins of Islam episode and given so many kind donations. However, it's come time to once again ask you to buy a narrative episode to ensure that I have the funds to keep the podcast going for the foreseeable future. It will be coming soon, and I will explain all then. Next episode will be a fun interview with Sean Munger, the man behind the Cry for Byzantium Twitter feed and the novel set during this siege, Zombies of Byzantium. And if you're interested, there is an episode of the Twilight Histories podcast and an ebook that goes with it, speculating on the possibility of an Islamic conquest of the Roman Empire. It's called Roma Islamica, and I definitely recommend you check it out. For now, though, thanks for listening, and let's try not to let the Byzantines be totally lost to the West.